I'm Ashton Addison from Event Chain for Investment Pitch Media and FinTech News Network. And today on Blockchain Interviews, we have Zach Abraham, the Chief Investment Officer at Bulwark Capital Management and the host of Know Your Risk Radio. Zach, welcome to the show and thanks for taking the time to be here. Oh, you bet. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. I'd love to kick off our interview with just a little bit of your background in finance and your recent focuses at Bulwark before we dive in. Yeah. So. Uh, came to came to the business honestly. My father and grandfather started a brokerage firm back in 1983. We specialized in uh, <clears throat> IPOs and and uh, private placements of, of small and micro cap um, um, natural resource type stocks, especially precious metals. Um, and never really considered doing anything else. Studied finance and economics in college, along with playing football. Um, I think at the time I was a little more focused on football than I was finance and economics, but yeah. um, that's obviously changed. And then took a job with a, uh, a mutual fund company right out of college and then went through the brokerage channels and ended up starting our own shop about five years ago. And we currently manage about mm, 130, 140 million of retail money. And um, yeah, so that's that's kind of the road to where how we got here and, and what we're doing on a daily basis. Very cool. And I know that you are the host of Know Your Risk Radio, and I wanted to touch a little bit on, on risk. There's a lot of different types of risk when you are managing a portfolio, and including as we near this presidential election 2020, you know, political risk as well. Um, how do you approach political risk in the markets when there are upcoming elections? Man, that's a great question. Um, something we've talked a lot about recently. <clears throat> I, I think political risk is really interesting. It, in the past, it's never really bothered me because a lot of political risk tends to boil down to binary outcomes, right? This person's mm -hmm. elected or they're not. Mm -hmm. And binary outcomes are pretty easy to hedge. So, right, right, mm -hmm. it, 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 it's not very tough. Um, this one is decidedly different because it's not so much what happens on November 3rd, it's the fallout of what happens after that, mm -hmm. right? That part of it to me is really hard to hedge. Um, right now we've got a good amount of cap cash built up in the portfolios. Um, we have some, you know, we're staying fairly diversified, trying to play it, you know, uh, as we see things changing on the ground. Um, but yeah, normally, like I said, I think it's a great question. Normally, it doesn't bother us. Yeah. I think there's a lot of hand wringing about it. Um, again, binary situations are easy to hedge. This one is a whole, you know, especially the other thing you have to look at is market valuations, right? If you have a disturbance in the market, how big of a drop could it result in? Well, when you're in the most mm -hmm. expensive markets in U.S. history, a lot. Right. So the, the risk, the risk is potentially really big to the downside. I just think you have to stay on your toes and stay nimble at this point and, um, you know, play it like you see it. I don't know mm -hmm. that there is a the other interesting one is that you're going into a situation like this that has so many outcomes and so many possibilities. Um, and you're doing it in an environment where the VIX is at 30, 32. Mm -hmm. Right. With volatility already that's so high, that takes another hedging, you know, typical thing that we would use for hedging off the table. So. It's just a very unique, bizarre situation. I, we're just trying to stay diversified and liquid at this point. Definitely, yeah, it's a great answer. And it is such an interesting situation, in part because of the pandemic and the stimulus and increased debt in the markets. And it seems that right now the economy isn't really equating to the market. And normally, you know, in an upcoming election, it would pr there would probably be more of a convergence and it would be more similar. So there are a lot of little extra risks. And, you know, with the, the Fed mentioning that they're going to keep interest rates low, uh, you know, it used to be for a few years and now it seems like many years. And who really knows uh, what, what that's going to happen? But consumers are looking for higher yields and a lot of capital has been flowing into the equities market. However, you're mentioning that you're also holding a uh, you know, strong cash position as well. Um, how has this market growing over this year uh, and the stimulus affected how you're, you've been rebalancing your portfolio and your investment firm's portfolio? Yeah, another great question. Um, I, you know, when I, we got through the financial crisis, I knew that we would deal with other issues. I ran a portfolio during the financial crisis as well. But I remember thinking specifically that we, we would see different challenges, um, but we probably never see markets that crazy. You know, and then 2020 came knocking. Um, so, I, I, again, I'll, I'll say the downturn to us in March and February was easy, m much easier to navigate than the bounce back has been. Um, you know, it, the fact that you'd see both multiple expansion and and real price, you know, new all time highs in a year where you know GDP is going to decline by seven to eight percent, that you, we've never seen anything like it. Mm -hmm. um, 
at all. So one of the things that we did was a, at the beginning of the year, uh, at one point, you know, we were 25% up on the S and P. So we were down like five. I think the S and P was down 34, 35, something mm. like that. Um, so felt like we were sitting pretty good at that point. Um, wish we had bought more at the bottom. Um, but it's been tough because, because, you know, and your question alludes to this, so I know I'm not breaking any news here, but, um, you know, the, what, what, the action and the response that you've seen in equity markets or in asset markets in general has been completely disconnected from the underlying fundamentals. Mm -hmm. um, and yet I almost feel like government intervention and central bank intervention and stimulus and all these things, I feel like they're sort of becoming fundamentals. I feel like they're going to be here a mm -hmm. lot longer than most of us think. And so it really is a balancing act. It's, it's you know, especially this year has been integrating enough things that we really believe in. And then also integrating some things into it that we think are more dangerous, but just to, you know, keep up with markets and, mm -hmm. and performance, you know, we've added some of those things sparingly. Um, but just to make sure that, you know, we don't end up with a year where the market's up, you know, 30% or something like that. And our clients are sitting on a 4% gain. Obviously that's not doing the job, but it's been tough. Um, you know, it's not, and it's not just the separation from asset prices, to the underlying economy. It's also the separation of the asset prices from the underlying performance of the mm -hmm. company, mm -hmm. right? They, you know, we, we could sit here all day long and talk about different companies whose stocks have gone parabolic and the underlying, right? The underlying fundamentals driving that company are nowhere near what the stock would suggest. Um, yet that's what's working and we work in a competitive environment. So it's been, it's been tough, basically just really focusing on risk management, focusing mm -hmm. on how much yeah. exposure we have at any given time and taking advantage of opportunities when we see them. That's kind of been it. Definitely. And it's really interesting to see it from the perspective of an investment management firm when you're managing other people's money and the market all of a sudden isn't really based on pure fundamentals as it was, you know, it, a few years back where you're, you know, it seems that the valuations are a bit inflated and there's bankrupt companies, you know, like Hertz or airlines companies that are going up and you and it may be more of a shorter term than a longer term. And you're trying to manage, you know, investments. D do you go with the trend and go with the flow and, and jump into things that don't necessarily have as much fundamental value as as they did when you were eval evaluating it a few years ago just because that that's the way that the market changes or do you do you sit back and, and keep to your strategy I, well if you could tell by the look on my face while you're asking that question i was grimacing um that that's been something really tough for us to adjust to because we traditionally are value managers Mm -hmm. um, so looking for underpriced securities and attractive prices, things like that. We're still engaging in that. I, I think the best way to describe that is that what we've done is broadened our horizon mm -hmm. of what value means. Um, so still trying to hold true to the ethos and the, and the principles that drove that, that, that principle, um, but just broadening our horizons because it is, it, it, and, you know, I think even saying that valuations are stretched, I think is you know, like reverse hyperbole, because, you know, uh, again, I think if you adjust the way we look at it, so if you adjust for earnings through the end of 2020, you know, I think that realistically, if markets end up anywhere in this neighborhood, you're looking at a PE ratio market wide of probably somewhere between 38 to 40 mm -hmm. um, in a year where you're going to see a seven to eight percent hit to GDP um, corporate balance sheets at record debt levels and climbing. It'll be the first recession in the history of the United States where corporate debt levels actually rose. You know, so you're looking at, for instance, a value stock. I hear the airlines get thrown around as value stocks. You're looking at several of these airline companies that are trading at greater enterprise values today because of the debt they've taken out of their balance sheet than they were trading at enterprise value prior to COVID. Mm -hmm. right? So, <laughs> you know, if you want to call that a value play, I guess you can, but it's not. Um, yeah. And, you know, that's where we see it. The, the other area where you'll look at value plays is in the energy space. There's a lot mm -hmm. of value plays there, right? Um, I don't know that I have ever seen so much negative uh, sentiment surrounding a sector as I do energy, mm -hmm. which makes it to me look really attractive in the long run. But, you know, you know this as well as I do. Investing is a long run game that you get judged on frequently and uh, in the short run, right? Mm -hmm. So. You know, we don't want to do the right, you know, it's, we run a business here at the end of the day. So we don't yeah. want to do the right thing over the next 20 years and lose all of our clients over the next three. So For it sure. really is balancing that. It's also looking at saying, okay, if we're going to go a little further out on the risk curve here than the otherwise normally would, 
making sure again where the risk management aspects come in and go, okay, we got to be a, we got to be accounting for that somewhere else in the portfolio. Definitely, and it, it I'm, I'm sure it's tough when you're managing. You know, you have to have that long term perspective, and then something comes along like today in the stock market where. You know, it's the biggest drop in the market since the beginning of September in the last two months. Right. And retail investors, they they play on that emotion of the fear, and they're like, "Oh no, it's it's down." And then the next day, it's it's back up, and they're happy. But you know, it yeah. they're calling you saying, "Why is it down?" And you you have to keep that you know, five to ten year strategy in place and just trust right. that that that's the strategy that you're going to implement, not change just because what happens on one day, right? And yeah, yeah. yeah so I think I think one of the toughest things about this environment is that. Yes, things have gotten crazy in the last two years. But as far as, you know, the other thing I don't think people are thinking about is if you look at the last 10 years dating back to the financial crisis, you're looking at the slowest growing decade in the history of the United States on real terms, including mm -hmm. the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. Yet at the same time, you've had asset prices across, you know, NASDAQ's up, what, 580% over that same period of time. S&P's up 350, 360, right? So it, 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 there, there's been a disconnect for a while in mm -hmm. terms of the underlying economic activity. I just think that you've seen it blow open and, and sort of what we've experienced over the last decade is now just happening on steroids, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, it, and, it, and it's gotten very difficult. Um, I think a perfect analogy of this is in the first week of the coronavirus stuff that started happening, we bought Zoom technologies, which has become a darling yeah. this year. We bought it for 103. Um, we turned around two weeks later and sold it for 118 because it was just too expensive. You know, I, I was like, okay, good trade. We'll pocket it. You know, what is Zoom close to at 540 or something like that? Mm -hmm. You know, we did a lot of work on it. We thought it was a good company. We thought it was going to succeed. But the reason we dumped it was because even we were taking into consideration the success that it would experience because of COVID. Mm -hmm. We couldn't get the numbers within 50% of where the stock's currently trading. Mm -hmm. on a fundamental basis yeah and yet obviously it doesn't matter right yeah. i wish i'd have held it you know mm -hmm. so i think that's a perfect microcosm and it's not us crying about spilled milk it just says that if you're a traditional investor you know why does warren buffett have 125 billion billion sitting on his balance sheet he does yeah. it because there's nothing else out there to buy mm -hmm. i mean you know at valuations that make any sense so then you say all of that in the context of zero percent interest rates like you said you brought up, and I don't think enough people have talked about this, mm -hmm. the fact that the Federal Reserve is talking about a V-shaped recovery while simultaneously forecasting interest rates at zero to 2023, right? Talk about yeah. talking out of both sides of your mouth, yeah. right? It just yeah. doesn't make a lot of sense. That's just kind of where we're at. Yeah, it seems, seems like it. And a part of that is just managing risk and preserving wealth and preserving capital, right? And I want to mm -hmm. ask your opinion on, you mentioned diversification and hedging your risk. And a lot of investors have been considering looking at hedged assets like like gold and silver and and Bitcoin as well as hedges to uh, the capital markets. You know, what's your perspective on those assets as a hedge and as a diversification right now? So I will I will <clears throat> again to avoid talking out of both sides of my mouth. I'll put my bias straight up there. We currently own no crypto assets or anything like a Bitcoin or any quote unquote alternative assets that would fit that space in our client accounts. That is purely a product of not having those types of investments available to us. Mm -hmm. We have advocated for all of our clients to hold somewhere between one and a half to two percent of their assets in blockchain, Bitcoin, something of that nature. I prefer Bitcoin. It's the one that I know the best. Um, and I think that, again, when you look at and and I was a um, I was a very early uh, Bitcoin caught my attention very early on. As a matter of fact, I remember the day I was sitting in my office and was it, I think it was 09 when it launched. Mm, I yeah. remember when they first bought the first pizza with Bitcoin. Mm. Um, and I remember being fascinated about it at that point because I saw what we were doing with QE, with the stimulus coming out of 08, 09. And I was one of those guys at, at that point that thought you would be looking at hyperinflation or not hyperinflation, dramatic inflation as a result of QE and things of that nature. Obviously that didn't play out. Um, but we were very paying a lot of attention to that. And once you dig deeper into those blockchain spaces and you really understand the way they work, I think one of the biggest misconceptions that people have is that quote unquote Bitcoin bulls or blockchain bulls are saying that they know with certainty where a certain investment is going. Mm -hmm. And the vast majority of professional money managers that I know that are Bitcoin advocates, they're not in it because they know exactly where it's going. Mm -hmm. They're in it because they've come to the same realization that I have, which is A, 
the monetary system as we know it has been flipped on its ear. And B, when you understand Bitcoin and bought those blockchain chain assets, especially Bitcoin in particular, there is no ceiling on its price, mm -hmm. right? It, it, like you and I were talking about, it could easily go to $500,000 per Bitcoin. And people are sitting there going, well, that's ridiculous. And I look at them and I go, on what basis, mm -hmm. right? You've got, you've got tech companies like Zoom Technologies trading at 90 times revenue, right? Um, I, I think that Bitcoin's technology that it offers will have far greater impact on the world than Zoom Technologies. Mm -hmm. Yet nobody's worried about paying 90 times revenue to buy Zoom. Mm -hmm. And they're sitting there going, oh, Bitcoin can't work. Um, the other thing that's attracted me to Bitcoin, I don't know, are you familiar with Mike Krieger, Li yep. Liberty Blitz stock? Yep. Okay, so he's a buddy of mine too. Um, and Mike really made this point come clear to me, which was that at, at a certain point, the populace in general is going to recognize the shell game that's being played by central banks, mm -hmm. right? And, and we can get into the motivations behind central banks. I think the vast majority of these central bankers are acting out of good faith. Like, I think they're doing what they think is actually the best thing to do. Um, I don't think that they're running around trying to, you know, jack everybody up or screw everybody up. Um, it, it, at the same time, the long term ramifications are what they are. I mean, you're going to go to, you know, currency devaluation as a principle, mm -hmm. as, a, as a, a way that they run monetary policy, just keep, de you know, depreciating the currency. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you look at blockchain through those eyes and you realize that it's, a, it's an escape hatch, it's a it's a rescue pod, if you will, out of the current monetary system to be able to own a truly deflationary asset. Um, and, you know, you and I were talking about this. The, the reason we advocated a one and a half to two percent position for our clients is if we're wrong and it ends up not taking root. And I still think along with the conversation I've had with Mike Krieger about it, I still I still contend that I think the biggest risk to something like Bitcoin or blockchain in general are the central banks themselves. Mm -hmm. They've had a great gig, right? They get to create money out of thin air and they got no competition. Um, but I, th when you look at that and you look at, I, I guess I, what, what I'm trying to say is that I think projecting Bitcoin out to $500,000 per unit is far less crazy than thinking that you're going to keep being able to run these kind of deficits and not see massive currency devaluation. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think Bitcoin going through the roof, if it doesn't, if it doesn't, then maybe our clients lose 50 to 60 percent of their money, which is a 1.25 percent hit to the overall portfolio. S&P was down 2.3 percent today. Right. If we're right or, or if Bitcoin does what we think it's possible of doing and it goes up by 20 X, then that 2 percent of your portfolio just made you the equivalent of 40. Mm -hmm. Right. So my downside is one and a quarter. My upside is 40. The convexity of that trade is just too much to pass up on. I just I think that people that are anti-Bitcoin, my answer to them is great, be anti-Bitcoin, but for God's sakes, buy yourself a one and a half to two percent portfolio <laughs> position, right? Yeah. It just makes sense. Yeah, I think it's great advice. And I like what you said about the price point. You know, it's it's hard to predict. Everyone has a different number, but it's clear that public companies in America are starting to put Bitcoin on their balance sheet. And yep. they're saying that it's because it's a better, you know, it's a hedge against the dollar. And they believe that it will devalue less than the dollar, you know, relatively to preserve the wealth of, of that public company. And we're seeing uh, multiple companies starting to do that as well. Now, PayPal introducing Bitcoin into the platform and you know, their 344 million customers, if they each wanted to buy 0.1 Bitcoin, they wouldn't even be able to because there isn't that much. So uh, it's, right. it's interesting. Um, and we're running and, out of time, and, Zach, but um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I'd love if you could give any last comments on, on Bitcoin and blockchain and just r risk and diversification um, for people that are uh, heading into the market through the end of this year and beyond to preserve their wealth. Yeah, I think that, I think that um, especially for the average retail investor, I think that something that hasn't gotten paid a lot of attention to is the bond portion of their portfolio. So... Uh, when you get bonds paying what they're paying right now, right? There's two reasons traditionally why we own bonds. It's for the income stream, the predictable income stream, and the the fact that it, it is a non core or or a negatively correlated asset traditionally to stocks, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the income stream aspect has been blown up because of interest rates where they're mm -hmm. at, um, and then the correlation, the correlation myth, as we refer to it, has been blown up this year. So bonds got hit basically just as bad as equities did, or darn near close. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at your bond portfolio for the average retail investor that owns, let's say, 40% of their assets in the bond portfolio, 
to, to, to use that bond portfolio that really can't do much for them, regardless of what happens economically, right? Mm-hmm. The most dramatic thing that can happen to that bond portfolio is a significant loss. To take a portion of that bond portfolio and to allocate to precious metals or to Bitcoin, I think makes all the sense in the world because it's never been cheaper, mm-hmm. right? So you're going to miss out on that 2% yield you were making on your bond portfolio to, to get the possibility of a 20x win in Bitcoin or uh, a 3 or 5x win in gold. Or mm-hmm. it, just, it just makes sense. And I think people really, if they don't take those actions, I think they're going to really regret it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it will endanger their financial security in the future. And again, take take some of those assets, diversify them away from stocks and bonds, buy some precious metals, buy some Bitcoin, and just have a more diversified portfolio. I just think it's I just think it's a it's a can't lose. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Well, great advice, Zach. Uh, I really appreciate appreciate you coming on to take take the time uh, for this discussion. And I think it's a really important time to do so. And um, I will leave the links to uh, your Twitter, Bulwark Capital, uh, in the description box below for the viewers. And thank you so much for the time, and let's follow up in the near future. Hey, sounds good. Anytime. Thanks for having me on.